So thank you all for coming today and I will speak today on the topic of going beyond comfortable unhappiness. Most people today are comfortably unhappy. <laughs> we have lots of comforts in our life but despite having comforts we tend to be unhappy. So, I will take this in three parts. First, we will talk about what we mean by comfortable unhappiness and what is the evidence that people are comfortably unhappy. Then I will talk about what is it that actually brings happiness. And then lastly, I will talk about how spirituality can guide us to the deepest happiness in life. So, <coughs> we if we had a time machine and went say 500 years back into the past, we would see that the kind of comforts that we have today are not only unavailable, but also are unimaginable for most people. They so say for example, say artificial heating, telecommunications, <coughs> air travel, these were unable even for royalty a few hundred years ago. So, we have had enormous technological transformation of the world and we have facilities and comforts far better than the past. And yet, we see that there is an enormous level of unhappiness. Now, at one level happiness is subjective. We can't really know who is happy and who is unhappy. People can put on a facade of happiness also. But if we observe a person's life and if we see what they do in their lives, we can more or less make out. If somebody needs destructive sources of relief, say if somebody is taking drugs, somebody is taking alcohol, lots of alcohol, then what some then what it or even somebody is compulsively watching hours and hours of television. What it means essentially is that their real life is at best too boring for them to live in. And that is why they are trying to escape to some other level of experience. And at best boring, at best it could be agonizing, it could be mortifying, it could be heartbreakingly distressing. So, when we see that people are looking, lots and lots of people far more than the past are having mental health problems. A oh, few months ago, maybe a month or so ago in Christchurch there was this brutal shooting and it is, it is a despicable act of violence which is committed and whenever any such acts happen we are very concerned. I was giving a talk in America and suddenly there was a gun alert and now and before just I was giving the class and I had turned toward the slide show to display something and then the gun alert came and I looked there is nobody in the class <laughs> and what happened and everybody had disappeared under their desk <laughs> because it was a gun alert and then the organizer told me you also duck under the desk. So of course it was a false alarm there was nobody there. But it's just a, but the point is that there is a lot of concern if killers just go on the rampage and kill someone. Uh, and understandably so, life is precious. But how many of us know that more than the number of people across the world who are killed by others in murders, in violent crimes, in shootings, more than the number of people who are killed by others is the number of people who are killing themselves. One million people commit suicide every year. One million people means one suicide every 40 seconds. That means since I started this talk about 7 to 8 people have committed suicide. So. This is the WHO calls this, the World Health Organization calls this a, one of the alarming social health crisis in the world. It is not just, it is a mental health crisis, but it is also a social health crisis. And 
Of course, suicide can have many very specific causes. But overall, it's not that life is far, far, far tougher than it was in the past. In many ways, with the comforts available for us, life is not that tough. So what is it that is missing? You could say that if somebody has committed suicide, at the very least we can say is that they were not happy with their life. Happy people don't commit suicide, isn't it? Yeah. So, if we see this alarmingly increasing number of suicide, that itself is some indication that unhappiness is increasing in the world. And then we also have other mental health problems. Depression is a huge problem. So overall, it does seem clear that there is a significant increase in unhappiness in the world. So this is the paradox, our comforts have increased far more than others, uh, far more than the past, but simultaneously the unhappiness in life has also increased significantly. So why is it like this? What is it that is missing in our lives because of which despite having comforts we are still unhappy? So, the Bhagavad Gita offers us an answer to this question based on an understanding of various levels of our being. Suppose you, you were just walking along your, near your house on the road and suddenly you saw your neighbor rushing out of the car, rushing out of their house and going into the car, running into the car, just opening the door, slamming it and charging out. Hey, where are you going? If you ask them. I am going, you saw them going in such frenzy. Ask, where are you going? Yes. Oh, I am going to fuel my car. Okay. But where will you go after that? Oh, then I will go to the next gas station and I will fuel my car over there. Okay. But after that, so then I will go to the next gas station. And I will fuel my car over there. But what after that? He says, no, I will keep going to gas station and keep fueling my car. My car needs fuel. Of course, car needs fuel. But what we drive with is different from what we drive for. Fuel is what we drive with. And it's required. Without that, we can't function. The car won't move. But putting fuel is not the purpose of driving a car. What we drive with is different from what we drive for. And the same principle we can apply to life that what we live with is different from what we live for. What we live with, we can say we have health, we have wealth, we have social connections, we have house, we have comforts. So all the comforts, what they provide us is things to live with. But what to live for? That knowledge is conspicuously missing in today's world. And people say, no, you create your own purpose for your life. It's okay. But life is so complicated in today's world that to try to create your own purpose, what am I meant to live for? I just gave a talk in Stanford University and I was in America about a couple of months ago and after that one American lady, she came to me and she was talking with me that her daughter has been in Stanford for 12 years. And now Stanford is one of the top universities and brilliant, you need to be brilliant to get into Stanford. So then I asked, why 12 years? So. He said that for 12 years she has been changing her major to discover what is her calling in life. Now her co-students are already graduated, postgraduate, working, some of them have already are married and have families and she is still in the first year of her graduation. So what has happened here, I give this example, of course it's an extreme example of the point that if we leave it to people, find your purpose of life, we can end up with endless confusion. And even if I say that, okay, I'll find my purpose of life, but 
okay that is my subjective decision about what the purpose of life is but objectively does life have some purpose the mainstream materialistic world view will tell us no life has no purpose in fact a prominent scientist steven weinberg said that the more we study the universe the more we understand the universe the more it seems pointless <laughs> the more we understand the universe the more it seems pointless now this statement is is tragically ironic why i suppose uh, now i am giving a class and somebody sends a message to me and i look at the message and it's all some strange squiggles i wonder what is this message now maybe it is in some language some script i don't understand so maybe i try to if i try to figure out what is the script so if somebody has sent us a message and it it is in some strange script and you try to figure out okay what what does this particular shape mean okay what does this combination of shapes mean and then gradually start finding out okay this shape means this letter this shape means this letter this set of shapes means this word and then the more you start understanding the message in terms of what the shapes mean what should happen the more we understand the message the more more we will be able to see okay what the point of the message was isn't it so if somebody has gone through all the trouble of writing all those squiggles and each squiggle means something then the whole message should also mean something if i find that every letter and every word in the message means something but the message doesn't mean anything what is going on i am missing something isn't it see mo the more the message becomes comprehensible the more its point should become clear but in the study of the universe which is done through science what is happening the more the universe becomes comprehensible the more it seems pointless so what is going on so if we ask scientists you know if say i drop this phone obviously i won't drop it <laughs> but if i drop this it will fall and if we ask why did it fall say because of gravity okay if the lights go off why the electricity has gone off so if we look at science science gives us explanation of why things happen the way they do in nature okay why does the temperature go up why does the ocean tide level rise why does the storm come why do why does the snow fall so various things in the universe start making sense when we study it with the eyes of science but the whole universe makes no sense it's like okay why does snow fall why does the temperature rise we have answer why do we exist no purpose how does that make sense it's like we find islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness oh here this makes sense this makes sense this makes sense but life no sense surely we are missing something so there is uh, science studies objective reality science studies things science studies matter and it's important to study matter but there is a the study of matter and there is a the study of what matters the study of matter and the study of what matters are two separate things now if we look at our own daily experience now if say after you go you go to this temple go back home and you say you know today say you meet some very nice people over here say i met a very interesting person today okay tell me about that person you say that person was 5 feet 3 inches okay what else oh that person weighed 70 kg okay now how many of us are interested when we talk about people you know we are not firstly interested in physical dimensions 
isn't it? We are interested in the personality. So, if the objective characteristics of a person matter. But if you want to relate with a person, if you want to know a person, it's not just the physical parameters that matter. It is the personality, the nature, their likes, their dislikes, their way of living, way of acting, whatever. Isn't it? So, in our daily experience of life, what we first, ex what we look for foremost is not the physical parameters. I suppose after this program, there is in the prasad, there is gulab jamun. This is a supposition, not a promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, suppose there is a gulab jamun. Now, if I tell you that, oh, okay, in the meal today, there is going to be a spherical object of 3 by 3 inches and viscous density so and so and mass so and so and weight so and so. Are you really interested in that? <laughs> Food, we what we experience. See, science studies the world as it is measured through objective parameters and that is useful, no doubt. But how we experience world is the world is primarily in terms of its its experiential parameters and the most important experiential parameter that we look for is happiness you know we want all, we want to be happy in life so <coughs> happiness itself is something which is you could largely say beyond the sphere of science now all that i am saying is the, all none of this is to criticize science science is very important a valuable body of knowledge but we have to understand that there are different branches of knowledge. And nowadays, one of the biggest fears in the world for young pe people and young people especially, but people in general, is something which was not in the top 10 lists of fears in the past centuries. Say that if we study the history of fear of the centuries, two fears have entered into the top 10 list in the 21st century. One is the fear of terrorists. And the second is the fear of rejection. If you try to form a relationship with someone and the person rejects us, abandons us and goes away. So, it's, it's a great cause of great fear to everyone. Now, when we want to form a relationship with someone, at that time, we don't really, uh, we all want to know, is this person for real? Do they really care for me? Is their affection for me genuine? Do they really love me? Now, when we want to know this, with all our scientific advancement, can we manufacture, we have like a thermometer, a barometer, can we have a loveometer? <laughs> let's see. If a boy says to a girl, I love you. Okay, let me take out my loveometer, let's see. <laughs> now, we can't do that. Because love is not something which is mathematically measurable. And yet, you could say it is the deepest reality. Now, if when we were born, newborn, at that time our mothers didn't love us, none of us would have survived beyond the first few months of infancy. It requires tireless affection and love from the mother's side to take care of a human infant. So you could say love is one of the most fundamental realities of life. And yet, there is no way love can be measured. Another reality is pain. Now, if my, if, my hand, if somebody's hand is fractured, then the doctor can say, okay, you must be in pain. The doctor can say, okay, how much is the, how much is the bone cracked? How much is the bone displaced? But there is no painometer to measure pain. Why is that? Because these are experiences internally. They are real but they are not mathematically measurable. So, why am I talking about this? I said that, uh, but the first point I talked about is that we are comfortably unhappy. And then we are talking about why is it happening like this? So, science by its progress has provided us a lot of comforts in terms of physical resources to make our life easier. And that is very powerful as far as it goes. But that is the study of matter. But the study of what matters, 
what matters truly for us is what we are experiencing internally in the past people might have had to work in the in the heavy sun and they would sweat because of the heavy sun's heat now we might work in a software firm in an air conditioned atmosphere and there we will sweat not because of heat but because of stress <laughs> so we may not experience the comfortable air conditioned atmosphere of the company all that we experience is the stress so for us what matters is more important than matter and unfortunately in today's world the question of what matters has been left entirely to people's subjective decision and there is no proper education to help us understand what is truly important in life and therefore when say if we we all have to live for something in life so at a very basic level we have certain bodily needs we need food we need sleep we have the urge to unite and procreate we have the, we have the need to protect ourselves from danger so food sleep sexuality and defense these are four basic animal needs and by animal i mean they are the, the needs of all living beings in the world so because our society has not given us knowledge of any higher purpose of life what we are doing is we are trying to do the animal activities in more sophisticated ways so when i give the early example of a person rushing out in a car to fuel to put fuel in the car so that's what we are doing most of our lives we are okay let me get better and better food to eat let me find a more and more attractive partner let me build a bigger and bigger house so that i can defend myself so we are focusing on these now all these are what we live with none of this is what we live for food is very much needed sleep is very much needed defense is needed procreation is a fundamental biological imperative all those are needed but none of this is what we live for it is what we live with and when we start living for this we can but what results by that is all these activities can give us a certain amount of pleasure but when we seek more pleasure from them nature responds by giving us more trouble nature has allotted a certain amount of pleasure through these activities when we use our scientific and technological advancement to seek more pleasure through these we may get that more pleasure temporarily but we'll get more trouble also so we can look at so many people suffer from digestive issues so many people suffer from sexual disease sexually transmitted diseases so many such people the man is the man or human beings are the only animals who eat when they are not hungry who sleep when they are not tired who mate when they have no desire to procreate and who fight even when they are not provoked so all these drives we keep doing more and more and we don't get any real satisfaction with it and what is the proof that we don't get satisfaction the proof is that we keep craving these activities more and more and more in more and more explicit more and more uh, more aggressive forms and still satisfaction eludes us so the body is a part of who we are the body is like our car and it's important for us to take care of the body but our life has some higher purpose and so comfortable unhappiness means see if you look at li the life for most people the source of happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness where we seek happiness is what gives us unhappiness we could see this most graphically in the case of addiction addiction when say when it is said about alcoholism first the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the drinker so people get trapped 
and nobody is born with a bottle of alcohol from their mother's womb nobody is born an addict but people become addicted and there is a, a drug addiction alcoholism and so many other forms of addiction this is an example of how the very thing that we think will give us happiness ends up causing us unhappiness and at a addiction is very vivid and uh, extreme, you could say an extreme example although it's not really extreme because millions of people are suffering from addiction but but for many of us the very things that we think will give us happiness end up giving us unhappiness because we are looking for happiness in the wrong place so <clears throat> what is so what is the cause of we being comfortably unhappy because we are what we are looking living with we try trying to live for that and that is called backfiring on us so the very very things which you think will give us happiness they end up causing us unhappiness then what can we do about it so the bhagavad gita explains that our life has a higher purpose and that higher purpose is spiritual spiritual evolution what do i mean by that so essentially happiness is not a worthy purpose for life what do i mean? what do you think i mean obviously everybody wants to be happy what do you mean it's not a worthy purpose see happiness is too cheap and too fragile a purpose for life why too cheap how many of you like humor humor how many of you like you like humor you know very few people will say they don't like humor isn't it humor you also like good <laughs> thank you but suppose somebody tells you from tomorrow i'll free you from all family responsibility all financial concerns all health concerns for the rest of your life you just watch comedies how many of us would enjoy that maybe for a few hours after that i want to do something with my life isn't it see or we could say there's some some small children sometimes people their relatives may come a friend they have to want to have some fun they might tickle the child now when the child is tickled the child starts laughing they tickle the child <laughs> now when the child starts laughing is that laughter happiness you could say one kind of happiness but if that were happiness then we could say all of us can manufacture our own perpetual tickling machine <laughs> and <laughs> we could be happy for the rest of our lives would we be happy no we would we would get bored stop it now this is enough so happiness itself is too cheap a purpose for life and it's not just too cheap it is too fragile a purpose for life why fragile because sometimes in our life we'll have to go through such situations where there is no happiness sometimes if a loved one is sick and we have to take care of them we may say i formed this relationship for happiness but there's no happiness over here but if the love is real you have to take care of that person when say uh a woman becomes pregnant and is going to have a child uh, the later stages of the pregnancy are not pleasant and if happiness is all you want there's no happiness in that thing so when we are go if happiness is the only purpose of our life then when we go through phases of life and there is no happiness there will be nothing left to sustain us so happiness is too cheap and too fragile a purpose to make our life meaningful to make our life meaningful now this doesn't mean that we should be unhappy that's not obviously the meaning the point which i'm making is that happiness is best experienced as a by product of a meaningful life not as a product that we chase after so if you look back at your own lives and think which were the more deepest happy moments of your life and they won't be the times when maybe you're watching a movie or you were just watching some comedies or something like that they will be the times when you are doing something meaningful 
and sign something which was deeply important for you. You read that. So, happiness is best experienced as a byproduct that comes from a meaningful life, not as a product that we seek after. When we do activities to get pleasure, we get some pleasure, but we also get a lot of trouble by after that. So, what is it that can bring meaning to our lives? What is it that we should drive for? Technology can provide us a lot of comforts, that is what we live with. But what do we live for? That, the Bhagavad Gita says, is spiritual evolution. What do you mean by spiritual evolution? It explains that we at, the Gita explains that we at our core are spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we are meant to evolve, expand in our capacity for wisdom and our capacity for love. Our capacity, we are meant to evolve in our capacity for wisdom and our capacity for love. And as we evolve in our capacity for wisdom and love, our, our, our wisdom helps us to comprehend what is it that truly matters. What is it that ultimately lasts? What is it that is most important in my life? And then we direct our love toward that reality. There are many things important in our lives and we could say there is a hierarchy of important things. And that which exists at the pinnacle, at the top of this hierarchy of important things, that the Bhagavad Gita says is God. God is not just some religious concept or some product of some belief system. God is what exists at the top of our hierarchy of important things. In that sense, everybody believes in God. Because everybody thinks something is important for them. But the question is whether what they think is the most important thing is really the most important thing. Is, is it something which is really going to help them in the time of need? Is it something which is going to bring true meaning to their lives? Somebody might be a alcoholic and they say, for me, alcohol is my God. Okay, but is this God going to get you out of trouble or going to get you deeper into trouble? Now, nobody will say probably that alcohol is my God, but if they consider that is the most important thing of their life, then effectively they are treating alcohol like God. So, somebody might say, cricket is the most important thing in my life. I just want to play and want my team to win. Okay, fine. But it's a game. What after that? What, what, what do you do if your favorite team loses? Is that, what do you do at that time? So, we need a God we need something which is truly important, which truly matters for us. And that thing has to be, if it is to truly matter for us, it's truly uplift us, that has to be lasting, that has to be eternal. I'll conclude with two points and then you can have a few questions. I suppose, so there was a child living somewhere in Africa, in the remote jungles, completely unconnected from the world. And one day that child came back to his home and said, Mom, Mom, I want a pizza. Now what would the mother say? What do you think what the mother would say? What is pizza? Or how do you know about pizza? Isn't it? If there is nothing in the child's environment, which could inform the child of a pizza, then naturally the question would come, where, where do you know, about, how did you come to know about a pizza? So, is something, so similarly, if we consider our longings, see our core longings, whatever they are, we have a need for food and food is present in nature. We have a need for, we have thirst and there is a need for, there is water. So, whatever are our core longings, they are provided for. One of the things that we long for is love. And not just love, we long for lasting love. And that's why so many of the movies and novels, they are about romance. And most romance novels, most romance movies have this theme of 
happily ever after. Now, in real life, there is no ever after. Nothing lasts forever. Even big, big mountains do not last forever. I was in New York a few months ago, the place where the Twin Towers existed. When that is, it is now kept as a memorial. So, when the Twin Towers collapsed, so actually it was not just a building that collapsed. It was the symbol of, um, of American and Western prosperity and power that crumbled with it. So, even the Twin Towers was not eternal. So, if nothing in our environment is eternal, why do we have a longing for eternal love? This longing is as out of place as a remote African tribal child is longing for a pizza. So, nothing outside us lasts forever and yet we have a desire to live forever. Where does this desire come from? It does not come from our externals, it comes from our internals. Inside us is a spark of spirit and that spark of spirit lives forever. And that spark of spirit longs to love forever. And for that aspiration to love forever to be fulfilled, we need an object that also lives forever and loves forever. So that object is God. Different traditions reveal God in different ways, name God in different ways. The Bhakti Yoga tradition uh, from ancient India reveals God to be an all attractive person who is named Krishna. So, spiritual evolution means that the purpose of life is to learn, to grow in wisdom, to know who is the truly worthy object of love for me and to grow in our capacity for love. Children may love their toys as they grow up, they may love their sports, they may love their jobs, they may love their uh, other things, but as we grow up, our capacity to grow, our capacity to love also has to grow up. And as it grows and matures, we learn to love the eternal. We learn to love the supreme divinity. And Krishna is the anchor who will never shake. That life will put, send us through many storms. And whatever we hold on to, it will start shaking. But if we connect with Krishna, we will not shake. Because he is unshakable. And for happiness comes at the deepest level when we connect with Krishna, who is the source of happiness. And based on that connection, we make a meaningful contribution in the world. Bhakti is not about rejecting the world. It is about reconnecting with the world with the source. So, we have our family, we have our jobs, we have our interests, we have our hobbies. Now, all these are meant to be spiritualized. So, what the Bhakti tradition tells us is that what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are is God's gift to us. So, we have certain abilities, certain talents, we have certain situations in our lives. So, this is something God has provided us. What we do with it, what we become is our gift to God. So, every one of us has certain talents, certain inspirations, certain capacities and when we use them in a mood of service, there will be two results, an external result and an internal result. When we use our abilities in a mood of loving service to God, we will be able to do a lot of good in the world. We will be able to do good in our world which is not in, in a way that is not self-aggrandizing. It is not in the sense that I want to prove to the world how great I am. I want to make a positive difference in the world. And whether we achieve external success or not, sometimes it depends on various factors that are not in our control. But by acting in a mood of service through our various roles, we will connect with Krishna. And that connection will be the source of lasting satisfaction. So, the, so, the car has to be driven not to the next gas station. The car has to be driven to a meaningful destination. Similarly, life is to be lived 
not just to get where we will get the next meal or where we will get the next meeting partner or where we will get the next bodily desire fulfilled. Life is to be lived to fulfill our spiritual longing. Spiritual longing for a lasting object of love. And when we evolve in this way, then through thick or through thin, we may go through them both. But with God by our side, we will find that our life will be meaningful. Life may hurt us in many different ways, but the connection with God will strengthen and shelter us. And we will discover if we stay devoted to God. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Machittaha Sarva Durgani, Mat Prasadat Tarishyasi. If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. So Krishna will protect us. The world can hurt us in many ways. But if we practice Bhakti Yoga, we will discover that greater than the world's power to hurt, is God's power to heal. Greater than the world's power to hurt is God's power to heal. And we'll be healed not just from whatever hurts that the world may inflict upon us, but we will be healed also from the basic meaninglessness that a materialistic life afflicts us with. And then, whether we have comforts or no comforts, still we will have happiness by Dint of our meaningful connection, meaningful devotional connection with the Lord. So I'll summarize. I spoke on this topic of why we are uncomfortably un we are comfortably unhappy and what to do about it. I started by talking about how we have phenomenal levels of comforts far more than a few centuries ago, and yet we have alarming levels of unhappiness. More, one million people commit suicide. That means more than the number of people who are killed by others, the number of other people who are killing themselves. This means people are profoundly unhappy. Then I discussed why is that? I talked about our scientific knowledge. We, have, we live in an age of science and science studies objective reality. It gives us a lot of knowledge of matter by which we can arrange comforts in our life. But science doesn't tell us what matters. What is really important in our lives. So, not knowing what is really important, we are making our bodily cravings, the trying to pander to them more and more as the purpose of our life. And that's like race, racing in a car to just the next gas station to fuel the car. What we are driving with is not what we are driving for. When we, the body can give us a certain amount of pleasure, but when we seek more pleasure through the body than what nature has allotted, then we also get more trouble through that. So the search for happiness often becomes the cause of the greatest unhappiness. We can see this in addiction and we can see this in so many other things at a lesser degree. So we all want happiness, but happiness itself is too cheap and too fragile a purpose for life. If somebody told us to watch comedy shows for the rest of our lives, we couldn't do it. And if happiness is all that we wanted, and if we had to go through difficulties where there was no happiness, life would become unbearable. So, what we need is happiness as a byproduct of something meaningful. And what is the most meaningful thing? That is spiritual evolution. To evolve in our capacity for wisdom and love. Wisdom means to understand what really matters in life. So we talked about, we all have various important things. What exists at the top of the hierarchy of our important things, that is God. So everybody has some God, but most people have false gods. That means what they think is very important, lets them down at the important times in their life. But there is an eternal reality. Who is our eternal object of love? We discuss how we all long for love and in nature our deepest longings do have fulfillment. Hunger has food, thirst has water. The longing for love is also like a deep core longing. And we long for lasting love. Nothing around us lasts. So this longing is as out of place as an African tribal child is longing for pizza. It doesn't come from the external, it comes from the internal, from our spirit. So that the object for which we are longing 
is the all attractive supreme that is krishna and spiritual evolution means to learn to direct our love toward krishna not by rejecting other things but by reconnecting everything with krishna so when we work in our day to day responsibilities in a mood of service to krishna when we practice bhakti yoga and infuse that mood of service then we get both a external result in terms of making a meaningful contribution using whatever abilities we have what we have is god's gift to us what we become is our gift to god and irrespective of how much external results we get when we have that mood of service we connect with god and that connection itself becomes the anchor that no storm can shake that devotional connection becomes the source of our everlasting satisfaction and that when we have that devotional connection then comfort or no comfort we will have happiness thank you very much hare krishna any questions or comments yes please thank you for the class uh, there's a saying actually actually the human beings are social animal so of course in my experience we have been brought up in a certain circumstances from the childhood and where we are materially more advanced or achievements we are thinking of that mm. we never come into contact with the spiritual you know, because even because of the parental and uh, yeah. because of the generations and when we come out of that and come into the spirituality we are facing a lot of hurdles to cope up with the spirituality okay and we don't recognize the spiritual happiness is the real happiness at that time so we are more into the material happiness and i just want to know which factor that distinguishes these two happiness is there any important factor that distinguishes the material happiness and the spiritual happiness okay or where to a draw a line okay good question on this uh, yeah. aspect so <coughs> we are brought up in more or less material atmosphere so we naturally gravitate towards material happiness rather than spiritual happiness yes. so can we demarcate between the two and where do we demarcate if we can so yeah i would say that material and spiritual are classifications which are to be understood at a philosophical level like there's a body and there's a soul but if say somebody falls down and they are in pain can we tell them i care for your soul but i don't care for your body no if we care for a person we care for their complete being body mind and soul <coughs> so similarly at our at our level we don't have to rigidly or constantly differentiate between material and spiritual happiness the important thing we could focus on is what is taking us toward krishna and what is taking us away from krishna that means we could say that in material also there is sattva rajas and tamas there is goodness passion ignorance that means there is that we could say in another terminology that is pro devotional there is non devotional and there is anti devotional so if somebody is getting intoxication somebody is getting into say violence towards animals just to gratify their tongues that kind of food is we are not being conscious of animals so that's anti devotional so that should be avoided as much as possible as much as possible um, at a serious level but the pro devotional or the non devotional that is there that can be connected with krishna so the essential difference between material and spiritual is more in more in terms of intention is it selfless or is it selfish now when i meet someone if my first thought is what can this person do for me then that is material consciousness if my when i meet someone if i think what can i do for this person then that is spiritual consciousness so the essence of spiritual and mental consciousness difference is an attitude of service or an attitude of self gratification so if we have that attitude of service say if we have a job now is that job material or is it spiritual 
well you could say it's material but then the job is what is help giving us a financial stability it is giving us social position and with that we are able to do uh, execute a spiritual life also so if we do that job in a mood of service swa karmana tam abhyarcha siddhim vindati manava in 1846 47 48 krishna talks about this quite a bit and he says that if you work in a mood of worship to me then that is the that work itself will lead to perfection so similarly the family responsibilities we can just say there's a material and i don't want to spend time in this or we can consider that these family members are souls who are parts of krishna and they're interested in my care right now so if i take responsibility for them in a mood of service to krishna then even by serving them taking care of them i'll grow spiritually so we often try to have like a black and white demarcation between attachment and detachment but bhakti is not so much about detachment as it is about commitment it's commitment to connecting with krishna and then commitment to connecting with whatever connects us with krishna so rather than worrying too much about uh, material or spiritual we can focus more on what will take me toward krishna and what will take me away from krishna or what is self centered and what is service centered if you have that attitude then gradually we will grow in our spirituality so there is you go I'll conclude this answer with one point see so there is you could say there is exclusive spirituality and there is inclusive spirituality exclusive spirituality means say for example you come to the temple and now here you have no material interest you come to the temple because you want to learn about krishna you want to do some seva so this is when you when we are doing our sadhana that's exclusive spirituality just focusing only on connecting with krishna we all need some time for exclusive spiritual connection with krishna without that krishna will not remain a real presence in our lives but after we have given that quality time for exclusive connection with krishna then there is a remaining time is for inclusive spirituality inclusive spirituality means that my career my health my family spirituality is included in that so through our exclusive spiritual practices we infuse within ourselves a mood of service and then we carry that mood of service into our various activities in life and that's how our spirituality becomes inclusive so we need a dynamic balance between the two okay. if it's only exclusive then we will become too other worldly and we will not be doing anything tangible in the world okay. but if we focus too much on inclusive and don't have time for exclusive spirituality then what we we will become too worldly and our spirituality will just become like a cosmetic for us it won't be real does that answer your question thank you thank you exclusive and inclusive hare krishna thank you is it solved okay is any one question anyone has any question you can ask yes please okay how do you deal with addictions it's it's complicated but i would say two three different things about it why i said it's complicated is there's no pat answer one answer for everyone see basically every unhealthy craving is a distorted expression of a healthy need i repeat that every unhealthy craving is a distorted expression of a healthy need that means say some people drink but they are social drinkers because they don't want to be odd people out everybody else is drinking so i also drink but if their social circle changes and then they come to a social circle where people are not drinking then they also stop drinking but if somebody is drinking as a way of escaping from life's problems from life's distresses life's burdens life's loneliness then even if they surround themselves with a better more healthy association because their need is still not being addressed so what we need to do is understand what is it that is making us do that it's not just a matter of will power will power is of course required but what is the need that this particular addiction is serving 
it might be something as simple as boredom. Like some people become addicted to internet. Now why? Because their life is boring. So the internet seems more stimulating. Of course, it is only superficially stimulating, and after all, it also becomes boring. That's why you need more and more stimulation on the internet after the time. But the point is that we have to address the root cause, understand what is the need that is being addressed in an unhealthy way by this particular craving, and that may require some introspection, that may require some discussion. It may also require some greater self-understanding. What happens is, if somebody has addiction, either they or the people around them start judging them. You are so weak-willed. Why are you doing this? Just give it up. But it's not that easy for them to give it up. So, if just before we succumb to that, we try, what, what is my thought? What is my emotion? Try to understand that. So, it's like say, if this is discomfort, situation of discomfort. Now, when we are in discomfort, none of us, discomfort is not a pleasant thing. Discomfort may be because of loneliness, it may be because of boredom, it may be because of overwork, it may be because of stress, it may be because of anxiety, so it may be because of heartbreak, so many things. This discomfort is one word which I am using. Now when discomfort comes, we need some relief. So we will gravitate towards that which we are habituated to. So we need to find a healthier way to address the discomfort. So that means, what, understand what is the discomfort that is impelling someone to go toward that addiction and then find a healthier way to address the discomfort. What does that mean healthier way? That means that is there something which you like to do but which is also uplifting. Say for example if somebody feels lonely and that's when they start taking drugs or drinking or indiscriminate net surfing or whatever. Then if there, is there something they like, maybe they like music. Maybe like spiritual music, maybe like, then keep that spiritual music readily accessible. So when the moment of discomfort comes, instead of gravitating toward that default unhealthy behavior, try to move toward that healthy behavior. Saying no is very difficult and it's painful to anything because we feel deprived by it. So we need to have something to say yes to. And we focus our energy on saying yes to that. So another example to illustrate this would be that if somebody is in an ocean and waves are coming and hitting them. Now if a wave comes, the wave will sweep that person away. And if you tell that person, don't get swept away. What do you mean? The wave is too powerful. So now if we are not in that part of that ocean, we may not feel that wave and we don't understand, why are you going in that direction? Well, they are not going, they are just being swept away. So somebody who has become addicted, they are like in a stormy part of the ocean where waves are coming again and again forcefully. So if you tell somebody resist that wave, it's very difficult. But what we can do is throw an anchor to them. And tell them don't try to fight the wave, try to hold the anchor. Now holding the anchor also requires strength. But the amount of strength required to hold an anchor and the success thereof is far greater than the amount of strength required to just fight against a wave. So the addictive desires will come like waves and we can't fight against them directly. But each of us needs to ourselves and for others help them find an anchor. Something which they can hold on to. So that's why I said there are things which we like in our lives and there are things which are good for us. And these two don't have to be entirely non-intersecting circles. We find out somewhere there is an intersection of the two. What I like and what is also good for me. And something that falls in that circle could be our anchor. And if we make it a habit to hold on to that, then saying no to those cravings would be easier. And the important thing is that we don't have to define ourselves in terms of our failures. We should define ourselves in terms of our successes. That means, say, if we consider that for all of us, even if we are not addicted to anything, but still we all have urges. And those urges have surges. <laughs> what that means is whether it is lust or whether it is anger or whether it is greed or whatever, it's not that that 
urge is constantly at a high level. But the urge sometimes has a surge. And at that time when the surge occurs, we just feel powerless. I can't do anything about it. And what happens? When the surge occurs, we succumb, we relapse. And then we feel so disheartened that even when the urge has gone away, still we stay disheartened. And the next time the surge comes, again we relapse. So, even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. That means, okay, when that urge comes, I don't know whether I'll be able to resist or not. But right now, I'm not troubled by that urge. Let me do something positive. Let me do something spiritual. Let me do something which will strengthen my intelligence, which will sharpen my conscience, which will give me spiritual strength. And if we keep doing that, then what will happen is, next we will becoming, we'll be becoming stronger. And then when the urge comes, we'll be in a better position to resist it. So sometimes we just define ourselves by that urge, urge surge, and whether we are able to resist at that time or not. See, we may fall down, but we don't have to fall away. Falling down is where we are not able to live up to a particular standard. Falling away is where we just give up the practice. Give up attempting to improve ourselves. So we may fall down, but we don't have to fall away. And understanding God and understanding God's love for us can be a very powerful impetus for us to persist. So there, is, there is nothing that we can do, there is nothing that we can ever do that can make Krishna stop loving us. No matter how many bad things we have done, Krishna is never going to say, I am going to leave your heart and go away. I will not be there as the Paramatma in your heart. No, Krishna is always there. Madruk prapanna pashupasha vimokshanaya muktaya bhuri karunaya namo layaya So, uh, entangled soul is praying to the Lord, my dear Lord, please free me. The Lord may say, why should I free you? He says, because you are free and I am bound. But the Lord may say, you are bound because of your own karma. He says, yeah, but yeah, I am bound because of my own karma, but you are very compassionate. So please free me. And the Lord may say, I have tried to free you so many times. You never took heed. He says, yes, my Lord, but you never get tired of trying to free me. <laughs> so, alayaya, muktaya bhuri karunaya namo layaya. You are liberated, you are immensely compassionate and you are untiring. So, even if we sometimes fail in our Krishna consciousness, you know, we can fail in Krishna consciousness, not fail out of Krishna consciousness. That means, okay, I couldn't follow this rule, I couldn't follow the standard, that's okay, but still I'll be Krishna conscious. Krishna consciousness is not just a matter of following certain standards. Krishna consciousness is a matter of consciousness. So if we understand and appreciate by studying Shastra, his studying Shastra is not a, studying scripture is not a matter of memorizing verses or just chanting some mantras. The essence, if there is one thing only we can learn from studying scripture, that is we gain the conviction that Krishna loves us. If we can gain that conviction, then we will naturally know oh, Krishna loves me. I want to reciprocate with him. I want to connect with him. So through our study of scripture, if we get that, so even if we fall, still Krishna loves us. Now Krishna is there not to punish us when we fall. Krishna is there to catch us when we fall. Catch us. You know, it's like a child is learning their first few steps and the mother is watching nearby and the child falls. The mother doesn't start laughing at the child, hey, you fell down. Yeah. The mother runs there and catches the child. So Krishna is like that. Krishna is with us there to help us. So if we strive to stay connected with Krishna, then that will itself purify us. So four things I said. First is that, try to understand the need that, need that can be addressed. That the unhealthy need, that the healthy need that is being fulfilled in an unhealthy way. Second is, try to find a more healthy way to deal with the discomfort. Discomfort leads to degradation. You find a healthy way to deal with the discomfort. And then that connection I said, find an anchor. Something which we like and something is good for us. 
and focus on holding on to the anchor, not on fighting against the waves. And lastly, understand that Krishna loves us and we just persist between the urges, understanding Krishna's love. And then gradually we will become stronger by spiritual practice and eventually we will overcome that addictive desire. Okay. So, yes, from. The addiction programs don't talk about spirituality, how to convince them. See, our purpose should not be primarily to preach spirituality, especially when we are dealing with distressed people. Our purpose should be to assist people. And spirituality is one resource that can assist them. And I would say it's not that they are against it. Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the biggest successful programs that helps people to get about alcohol. And they do talk about now, I need to entrust my life to a higher power. They don't necessarily refer to God of one religious denomination. They talk about a higher power. So, self-transformation requires access to some power beyond ourselves. And that's widely talked about. But, what has happened is, religion in today's world is seen as a source of sectarian conflict. And that's why people are leery about uh, in, in, in anti-Christian circles, they use the term called Jesus smuggling. What do you mean Jesus smuggling? That means that where God should not come in, you are bringing in God over there. That is, you are trying to impose God and your faith on us. So, we don't want to do that. Basically, if we provide people wisdom and resources for self-transformation, then gradually people take up. So, the way I, whenever I present in mental health forums or something like that, I focus not so much on God as on the self. The model of how the body and the mind are different from the soul. And then, even if you want to present Krishna, you don't have to present Krishna as God. Or, as a, a, certainly not as a Hindu God. We present Krishna as the object of loving yogic meditation. Right. Now, for centuries, yoga practitioners have meditated on this conception of God. So, instead of talking, this is God and you have to believe it, this is a conception of more God that has uplifted the consciousness of millions of practitioners for millennia. So, try that out. So, if you present it in a descriptive way, not in a prescriptive way. Prescriptive, this is what you should do. Descriptive is, this is what has been done and this is what benefited me, this is what benefited many people. You can try it out. Then if you present it that way, people are ready to accept it. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande.